Yeah. At the end, you mentioned that our brains are not trained for. So what would you say is a behavior or that comes naturally to us? How do we naturally behave? So I think that if you kind of took it uh, very, very to the beginning, some behaviors are really written into our DNA. So you're born with those behaviors. Uh, they're, they're kind of part of your making. There, there are feedback loops also from your physical body to your brain. Uh, if if you have the making of a, an athlete, you will essentially start feeling it younger. If you're of course gay or straight, you will start feeling it young. So a lot of elements of kind of who you are start manifesting themselves at a very young age and they, you don't know what to name them necessarily, but you already kind of exhibit them. So that's one. Then also there is a, how the environment treats you as a young person, which shapes up your view. Uh, if you're black or white, not only there's kind of what your kind of skin color is, but also how the environment treats you. And you might not know exactly how to interpret that, but you might see, for instance, if you're a white kid in a black school, okay, as a five-year-old, no one's going to come and tell you, hey, know that you're a white kid in a black school. It's not going to, but you will somehow sense the things. All of those things kind of leak into your psyche and they also affect your behavior. And then at the end, there is kind of what you learn and who you become that's shaped by your peers and your friends. And, and you end up like acquiring this like thing that we vaguely call your psychology uh, at some point. And we don't really see this happening. It's kind of happening like, you know, gradually and we don't know. But when it happens, it becomes harder and harder to get out of it. So you have about habits. I say that they form as kind of very slow, but at, but at any given point, you can know that you have them. And the older you are and the more routine they are, the harder it is to change them. Um, that's what we're trying to do here. Find ways to change them nonetheless. Hey, Moran, thank you for coming on and welcome to the Rebound Talks. Thank you, Antonio. It's a pleasure to be here. I've heard you say in uh, previous interviews that we're just one voice out of many in our head and we're not even the most important one. What do you mean by that? So it's mechanically, if you look at the brain, you will see that the brain is made of various modules, dozens of modules. Each of them does one thing. One module uh, feels things. Feelings happen in one place in the brain. And they just happen there. Another part of the brain, it controls your navigation. When you move around, it tells you where right and left is and how to find your home back. Another one does mathematics for you. And there are many modules that have their own life, as in they have desires, they have uh, wishes, they have emotions of their own, they have components that uh, have uh, bad histories that they want to avoid. And these voices uh, also vote when you're making decisions. It's just that not always do they win. And if they don't win, you have no understanding of what they did. They stay underground and you just don't hear them. And I think that we are the sum of all of those voices, but we think that we're always one voice. We think that we're only one because whenever there's an election, there's one winner and we don't know who the losers are. And we have all these voices and in terms to making day-to-day -day decisions, what percentage would you say is our prefrontal cortex, our rational mind, rather than maybe our subconscious and the rest of the brain? So if we want kind of to be precise percentage, I would say uh, it varies a little bit within person and it varies within your life. When you're a baby, you have a lot less control than when you're an adult. Uh, you then lose it when you get very old. But uh, kind of if you wanted to take a, a quick kind of, you know, take home number that people can remember, even though it varies, I would say about 12% of your brain is the conscious, fully controlled, really speaking, communicating and controlling the parts of the body, like moving and so on. And the remainder 88% are things that happen under the hood that you sometimes have no access to. Those include the, you get tired. You don't really say time to be tired. Let's turn on tiredness and be tired. It's kind of happening to you and you're, even though it's in your brain, even uh, emotions, which you have some control over are still kind of happening to you. You get sad that like you're exposed to it. So all of those go into the 88%. Hmm. Um, I like stoicism a lot and it's all about trying to get more control in the rational mind and living a virtuous life. So how neuroscientifically, 
how can we give more control to the rational part of our brain? So th there are many, many ways ranging from basic behavior day to day to, you know, surgeries and, and taking the right drugs and, and making your kind of connections happen differently. But I think that uh, here is kind of a, a practical one that anyone can do. They don't need to have a neuroscientist in their uh, living room. I think a uh, practice a few things that actually give voice to the not speaking ones. So first of all, uh, uh, there are classical ones, which is therapy, artwork, and, and the meditation, things that basically silence the common uh, response reactive mechanisms and give kind of enough silence for other voices to speak. If you meditate, I don't really, but if you do, you're usually required to kind of not speak much, either be silent entirely or focus on one thought and let it. And basically by doing that, you kind of uh, zoom in on the one thing that's speaking and letting in that and kind of suppressing it. And then you give rise to others. You, you, uh, if you would go to therapists, they would ask you a question and talk to yourself. And presumably they are trained to help you navigate yourself out of the kind of immediate intuitive response and give rise to the unconscious. This is kind of Freud's big story. Like if you talk, uh, you can let other voices gradually take over. Outwork is another version of that. If you play music and sometimes it feels like the, the hands are going by themselves. So if you uh, paint, you don't really know actually which brush stroke is going to go where and it's happening. And of course, again, I'm kind of um, invoking Freud now twice in the, the open air. I'm not a Freud person, uh, but uh, dreams is another uh, lens into it. So all of those are just ways for the parts of you that are usually voiceless to be more active. And if you don't do any of those kind of more introspective things if you choose, I think another very practical one, two, I guess, is one is to be funny. Telling jokes kind of gives rise to, to those voices. Like you laugh not by uh, saying, oh, it's funny that blondes are X or that, uh, I don't know, all Polish people are Y. You kind of, uh, it happens to you with your subconscious kind of expressing something. So if you practice, finding what makes you funny and doing more of that, you will actually train your brain to give more and more rise to parts that are hidden. That's uh, one. And then it's another one. It would be to change your mind mid conversations. So that's, that's very hard. But like imagine that you and I are arguing right now. What happens typically is that I even more kind of settle to my point and you settle to your point. And it's very, very hard for us to come together. And maybe we're going to kind of decide to lower the flags and, and come together. But, but we usually tend to kind of dive even deeper into our points. If you decide in the next time you argue with your friend or your colleagues to no matter what, halfway flip sides and take the position entirely, it will be hard and you will find all the reasons in the world not to do that. And you even will struggle with it. And you kind of say, yeah, I'm going to say that I am with them, but I actually will deep inside. If you really practice changing your mind entirely and owning the other person's view for a while, you will practice doing something that your brain is not trained for, which is to kind of give the automatic systems the first voice. A lot of options I gave you. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. And a lot of great ones. Yeah. At the end, you mentioned that our brains are not trained for. So what would you say is a behavior or that comes naturally to us? How do we naturally behave? So I think that if you kind of took it a uh, very, very to the beginning, some behaviors are really written into our DNA. So you're born with those behaviors. Uh, they're, they're kind of part of your making. There, there are feedback loops also from your physical body to your brain. Uh, if, if you have the making of uh, an athlete, you will essentially start feeling it younger. If you're, of course, gay or straight, you will start feeling it young. So a lot of elements of kind of who you are start manifesting themselves at a very young age and they, you don't know what to name them necessarily, but you already kind of exhibit them. So that's one. Then also there is a, how the environment treats you as a young person, which shapes up your view. Uh, if you're black or white, not only there's kind of what your kind of skin color is, but also how the environment treats you. And you might not know exactly how to interpret that, but you might see, for instance, if you're a white kid in a black school, okay, as a five-year-old, no one's going to come and tell you, hey, know that you're a white kid in a black school. It's not going to, but you will somehow sense the things. All of those things kind of leak into your psyche and they also affect your behavior. And then at the end, there is kind of what you learn and who you become that's shaped by your peers and your friends. And, and you end up like acquiring this like thing that we vaguely call your psychology. 
uh, at some point. And we don't really see this happening. It's kind of happening like, you know, gradually and we don't know, but when it happens, it becomes harder and harder to get out of it. So yeah, I say about habits, I say that they form as kind of very slow, but at, but at any given point, you can know that you have them. And the older you are and the more routine they are, the harder it is to change them. Um, that's what we try to do here, find ways to change them nonetheless. Yeah. And I really like your point that I've seen you mention before that just by hanging out, like if you want to be funnier, hanging out with people that are funny, that like rubs off on you or hanging out with people that are productive, it rubs off Absolutely. on you as well. Yeah, I think it, it, in, in, in multiple ways, in ways that you actually consciously become aware of, you see uh, your girlfriend getting ready to go out 20 minutes before and you say, okay, I guess there are people who get ready 20 minutes before. I should try to get 20 minutes. Like you kind of consciously really take that because you, you are exposed to that. And some are, are unconscious. Uh, you might not kind of even tell yourself uh, that it's time to get ready because when it, like with the alarm clock, because, but you will maybe uh, stand next to a lot of comedians for a while. And they won't tell you, you know, to be funny, you have to uh, make a play on words and here's how it, they won't kind of tell you, but you will start kind of picking up their timing you'll start picking up uh, their facial expressions when they get to the punchline. So you will get things that you wouldn't be able to name and you wouldn't know that you acquire them, but spending enough time with people who exhibit them will rub them onto you and by osmosis, you become funnier or on time. Hmm. So this is all digging into that sort of things that we don't notice, but they're there and they somehow shape who we are. And I love to dig into what you're doing now with dreams what experiments are you doing and what what have you been finding so to start for dream to kind of take us there the way, the way you said we know now that a lot of things in the environment change our cognition in ways that uh, we don't control we're exposed to them and when they happen we don't really give them enough attribution so the temperature in your room right now leaks into your psyche you think differently because it's hot or cold a little bit the, the height of your chair or how comfortable whether you washed your hands before you talk to me changes things so all of those things are we call that uh, as a kind of neuroscience research field we call it embodied cognition the cognitive elements that the environment or your body basically gives you and and, and those are real like the taller you are the uh, if you're lightweight uh, if you're a man or a woman if you're shaved or not all of those things end up somehow Manifesting stuff in your thinking. Now, to take it to the very extreme that you kind of led us to, uh, many of those uh, components, they, I'm, I'm giving them now voice, they want to speak, they want to manifest themselves, they want a kind of part of the action. And normally they don't get because uh, the way we're built mechanically is that there is one language center, it sits right here. It's connected to another part of the brain that is kind of the homunculus, the, the part that controls your senses. And this part usually speaks. That's the part that usually is the first to answer. And we hear ourselves speak and take agency and ownership on that and believe that this is our thoughts. We don't really give rise to the other parts. However, there are moments where this part is dormant, literally. When we sleep, it's speaking rarely happens. Uh, only, only if it happens, it only happens in one part of the night in a very concrete moment where the, this part again gets for a second kind of some energy to do something. Most times we're just kind of shutting down uh, many systems and in doing that, we actually give rise to other systems and those systems manifest themselves. And we suddenly get to see a movie coming from different parts of our brain. Dreams are uh, one of those things. And uh, I think that the last couple of years of research, including mine and others, has done something wonderful to dreams that none of the researchers prior to us had, which is we can extract them. So we can now use neuroscience tools to basically put something on your head or scan your brain or, or, or do things that involve extracting data from your brain that end up with you going to sleep, waking up in the morning, and someone has on a, a file piece of the action. Like they might have some visuals on your dream, or they might have some kind of which memories were active when you dreamt and they can tell you, okay, maybe this. And then they can do two things. One is they can ask you what you think your dreams were. They know what your dreams were. They can compare them and say, hey, why is it that uh, Anthony thinks that in his dream he was with his mom, but he was actually with his dad? Like, why did his waking up brain flip the characters? Like, what, what is it? And kind of try to 
you know, confront you and, and use that to help you understand like what's going on. Then we can also tell you if you forgot your dream, here is what your dream was, and you just have access to more of them, which is, you know, many people just forget them. So we can go give it to them. And if you even forgot half, we can give you just the beginning and kind of give you the prompt and you can continue. So we can just give you access to the vault. And this in itself means that now we are starting to build a database of dreams that is much, much bigger. Now, uh, uh, many things that I'm doing and that I'm going to stop uh, and, and give you kind of room to ask anything you want on, on that. We also are now uh, being able to play with waking you up in your sleep, but keeping you asleep. Or what it means is we wake up your consciousness, but you stay dreaming. Or effectively, what happens is that you go into a state called lucid dreaming, which is you're in your dream, you're still asleep, but your consciousness, this speaking part in the front wakes up. And now it says, oh, wait, where am I? I'm in a dream. Okay, first, let's kind of take a moment to kind of recognize that. And if I'm in a dream, but I'm the director, it's like a movie with the ultimate special effects that I'm the director. Uh, so I can choose to, you know, uh, open the window and fly, which is what the majority of people do the first time they get this experience. Or you can say, you know what, all my life, I wanted to spend an evening with a, a Newton. Uh, Unfortunately, it's not here, but let's kind of get into my dream. And then your brain will create this ultimate VR experience when Newton knocks on the door, comes into your uh, living room, sits down, you drink coffee, and you get to ask him questions and he answers. And it's, it's as real as it gets because your brain conjures Newton the way uh, it sees Isaac, and you get to talk to him and you get asked questions. And, and, and it's always surprising that your brain can kind of for the sake of the for the, the time of the movie is you know making a beautiful narrative that you're the hero and, and that's something that we now can kind of start to control better and better and you can induce that how, how do you induce that and is it something that you can induce easily how does the process go so it 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 would be nicely tied to how we started about 12 percent of our population can do it naturally so almost like it's as if the same mechanisms in the brain that control who controls what aligned with a uh, lucid dream. So some people, and I'm sure there are many of your audience that will say, oh, that's that's not even a problem. I do it every night. Some people just naturally do that. So they can go to sleep and they can kind of prompt themselves to wake up in the middle of the night, take ownership of their dreams and do things with that. That's one group. Uh, and uh, a little bit of the remaining 88% can be trained for that. They don't know they can do it, but they can be trained for that. And they can even, uh, you can even know before they go to sleep if what's the chances of, of being that group. So you can kind of, there are a bunch of techniques that you kind of do with your eyes. You try to roll them back. There's, there's a, a kind of trick that you can try that allows you to see if you're what's called suggestible, more or less. And, and that's a, and it aligns with those people who can also be easier uh, candidates for a, um, hypnosis. There are a lot of things that kind of go together and these people are the kind of ideal people. Most of us are not that. And now uh, what we're playing with is essentially using stimulation from the outside to wake up the brain. So what it means is that you, if you're establishing this study, you go to sleep and we have someone monitor your brain activity while you're sleeping and they kind of look at your brain throughout the night and they wait for you to get to this particular stage of the night it's called a REM, it's short for rapid eye movement. It's the state of the night where dreams are more likely to happen. And it's also when your brain is kind of, it looks from the outside like you are awake, but your eyes are closed and they're moving around left and right. So that's that's all that's happened. Like everyone, if you look at just your brain, they would think that you woke up. The brain is very alert and it's kind of moving and, and that's where dreams happen, but you're still asleep. And what we would do then is we would take another machine. It's called a TMS is the name. It's a, basically a magnetic device, that a, a little coil that you put next to the head and you inject magnetic fields in a specific area. And then we turn it on and we put it next to a specific location, either the uh, temporal areas or the frontal areas. And uh, there's a lot of science behind it. Like those are the areas that you need to wake up because that's where the memories or the parts it speaks are. So you put it next to those parts and you zap it. And even then you don't just zap it no regularly. You have to zap it in 25 Hertz or 40 hertz, or a specific frequency, which presumably uh, activates, uh, it's called gamma oscillation, it activates specific brain cells that are usually the connector cells. And so, so I'm giving you kind of a little bit like uh, unnecessary details, but 40 hertz or 25 hertz in the frontal of the temporal during REM 
to people about two minutes into the REM sleep will wake up the uh, consciousness, but keep you asleep. And from then on, you're on your own and like you're controlling your dreams. And this presumably from, I'm, I'm going to be cautious in like uh, telling you too, that it's like a guaranteed thing, but it seems to be uh, working with a much larger group. So it's not like 12% anymore. Now it's kind of many of us could be part of that. And so that's in our pipeline, a tool that can basically give you control of your dreams, you know, four times a night, typically people dream. And now they can be the Steven Spielberg of their own uh, movies. Wow, and that would be the most amazing product. Have you tried it yourself? Have you used it on yourself? Yes. So, so I, I mean, I, I played with it. And uh, so the, the thing is, the reason it's, it's a tough product to create is it requires someone on the outside sitting next to you with this coil and also looking at your brain activity and realizing that you're in the right side. If you just zap the brain at some different time, the person either wakes up or nothing happens. So you have to have a, a brain technician or a sleep technician, someone who knows how to do what's called the polysomnography, like the reading of those brain waves to say, aha, uh -huh, now she's at REM sleep, I'm gonna wait. I'm, so so it's, a, and, and for that you have to sleep with a bunch of things that measure your brain activity and your eye movement. So, so it's not at the level yet where it's a commercial in the sense that you can do it like I mean, Alexa can do it for you. You have to have a person with a very high salary, those are the lab sleep technicians that sit there while you sleep for seven hours and wait for you to get to the right moment. If we become good at kind of having machines detected for us, then I can see the product. So, so when I was playing with that, you know, I was fortunate enough to, to have someone kind of be there. Uh, and, and I think I told you in the beginning that there are a lot of solutions, a lot of amazing things you can do if you have access to a neuroscientist. Like if you want to change behaviors and you have access to the inside, you can do a lot more things than what I said, which is like, you know, d d decide who to hang out with and like uh, play games about changing your arguments and so on. But most of us don't have the access to those unless we're subject to an experiment. So I was focusing on things that anyone can do at home. But yes, the, there will be a day where it will be a product. And I hope that this day will come soon. And I hope that I will be part of ge getting it done. Yeah. For sure. As soon as you have it, let me know. I'll promote it 100%. <laughs> <I will. laughs> and you've studied human behavior a lot, the brain. You were even a hacker for like 10 years. With all that research and all, studying in all those different fields, what insights have you learned about consciousness? So there's a... a I'm going to kind of think of myself for a second. There's one thing that I try to finish every talk that I give, which is, I guess, the take home message from most of my research. And I'll give you a second one that I don't usually uh, speak about, but I think is also interesting and relevant. So there is kind of one more vague, uh, and I, I'm pondering about that recently a lot. And I, I learned that it took me a while, and I think some people naturally have it, and then they would find it obvious, and they would say that's not a learning, and some wouldn't, and then it would be impossible for them to learn it. The, the thing that I uh, had to learn, and it took me 20-something years, because I only did it when I did my PhD, is that the world is not black and white, but it's mostly gray. That's the title, and I think some people say, of course, and some people say, like, that's impossible. You know, I was a scientist, I guess, as a kid, and I believed that everything, like, you either are sick and then there's something a protein doesn't work and if we find it and we move it then you get healthy or you're healthy and you don't have this protein and, and if you're saying that you have epilepsy there is a neuron in your brain that is misfiring and if we take it out you're going to not have epilepsy and it's true for some diseases it's true for epilepsy and it's true for uh, but it's less clear with a lot of things that we find out right now it's kind of it's like asking a, a, when you fall in love when did you fall in love exactly like it's can you know when you're in love and you know when you're not in love, but it's very hard to kind of say it was when she said this that I fell in love, but when it was when he uh, did this gesture that I. It's kind of like it, it's gradual, and most life happens there. Diseases happen there. They they're not kind of cut like you do this and you're healthy. Uh, uh, relationships happen there. Psychology happens there. It took me a lot of time, and it sounds a, a little bit of kind of trivial because if you get it you get it but i know that einstein for instance didn't get it all his life right he himself could not believe that there are equations in physics that describe the world that have a probability in them he, he couldn't accept it it's like there's no way that i fire a gun and the bullets are going to get either here or here with some probability lower but there like it just doesn't make sense like all of the world that he believed in 
was classic and it was like black and white and there was laws and you can write f equals m a and that's it that that's like if that if that's true then then that's true so he had a hard time and i think not uh, you know uh, to kind of hang myself on like the einstein shoulders but i think i also have so that that's like a very kind of big broad one that speaks to the brain and to everything i'll give you one more concrete it's the one i finished my talks with is that i think that the learning that i just said that opened with that we have many many voices in our brain that speak uh, together is one that i can speak about as a scientist but when it comes down to day to day i and i think everyone i talk to forget that we kind of be believe and behave as if we're one and we control everything and we know the answers and if people ask us why we give them answers we say oh because of we never say and say not i know i have no idea something happened to me and i don't know why i did it and, and like it happened I, I can I, I know the actions but i don't know if i really prefer the toothpaste on the left or the on the right i just speak the one on the right and i can give you an answer but i don't know and if someone asks you why do you hate this or love that you can give them an answer you say i love you because you're the smartest woman that i know or because you're the funniest but no chance this is the answer because if she becomes less funny you still have her or if she says something really stupid you still love her so so it's not that we can kind of uh, understand ourselves and i think that the mistake and the thing i try to myself is to refrain from answering questions and, and even asking why like asking why is the root of us then thinking that there's a classical answer there's a correct answer and this is the answer and if you try to yourself not do that you will get better in being more an observer of the world and kind of saying okay that's interesting this are the, this is the reality i'm just kind of witnessing it without kind of trying to collapse it into one answer and i think it's going to be a good training for everyone hmm. and how can we be in that super open-minded state and you being a scientist being there but still making headway still finding different laws and different things that seem to be true almost all the time so i think the thing that we started with are the things i would also end with i think that all of the ways to be introspective art therapy meditation uh, just being quiet sports is one more thing like when you kind of run and you get to a state where you really are in the zone in the moment like you, you you're so exhausted and so tired that you don't have kind of time for rumination you focused on like i'm going to move my leg one more thing and that in a way gets you into this state of focused attention and suddenly if you continue to run people describe that that they kind of start you know they start going beyond the moment to moment pain and they can have thoughts that are profound they don't speak they can't they, they, so their brain is kind of focused dreams another one of those and i think that so those are the those are the things you can all do at home and i think that if you ask me to, to repeat the two that we did if you train to become funnier laughter and, and and humor is an exercise of playing with our mind in ways that we don't understand surround yourself with people that are exhibiting those, all of those things they will force you to change your mind and expose you to your brain in different ways that you didn't know were in you and then when neuroscientists like myself create products that are cheaper easier accessible then i would advise to any person that can to pair up with a neuroscientist and scan their brain and learn to you know, map their profile in the end that's the kind of closest we can get to quantify you from you know within i've been wanting to ask you this question about consciousness i tried hinting at it before why do you think it's still so hard to answer the consciousness problem we don't know exactly if it our brain acts as a receptor or our brain actually is the one generating the consciousness why have we had so much trouble i know you said we shouldn't ask why but what where are you leaning to in in the in the consciousness debate there's a joke by by a scientist or comedian i don't even know who started but i i kind of hear it all the time uh, it says something like if our brain were if our brains were simple enough for us to understand then we would be too simple to understand them and i think in that we embody kind of the thing like where consciousness is kind of the core the kernel of our psyche and that's the limit also of what we, of the thoughts we can do so we can only uh, explore and investigate and in, introspect on our consciousness with our consciousness so if if it's limited we're a little bit less than the we like you know and and uh, a creature living in a 2d space it looks at like a 3d person walking around they live on a on a flat page and they're like an ant 
and they see the, the legs of a person walking. So they see suddenly something in their space, but then it disappears and appears. This is kind of how consciousness is for us. Like it's, it's out of our ability to, to really process. So that is, is pretty sad if I said, if we really believe that, because then it means that it's, it's, we should give up. I think that like most things, even though we have no access to the kind of seeing component, we can we have access to the traces of what it does and we can learn them. We don't really see dark matter or, or feel or anything, but we still investigate it. We, we don't do a good job in that, but basically say, okay, it affects things in that we can experience. So we'll measure those things. And, you know, we do hedron colliders are allowing us to kind of introspect the beginning of time, even though we can't really be there. So, so I think science is making it kind of moves in the, this direction, but we also have to remind us that it's limited. So now concrete, where do I stand on that? So I think uh, I'm, you know, neuroscientists kind of uh, vary on basically one dimension, which is how much of a materialist you are versus dualist. Materialists believe that everything is in the brain. And at the end, if you understand all the neuronal circuitry and so on, you can understand consciousness fully. And dualists basically believe that there is the material brain and there's also a soul, uh, an unmeasurable, un kind of testable, uh, floating thing that is influencing the world, but isn't really uh, measurable. And that, that, you know, that violates the laws of physics. Uh, that there are things that affect the world that cannot be measured uh, as we understand it right now. So it's a little hard for me. So I would say I'm leaning towards the materialist uh, kind of uh, side of that. Uh, at the same time, I think I'm a, a open to, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of accepting of people who come to me with like a, the craziest stories. I have a folder that, and I talk to all, all of them. So, so I would get, Nowadays, it's on a daily basis. So every day, it used to be every week. But I get an email from someone who saw me talk, and I'm sure it's going to happen after your, your, your podcast airs. Someone who says, look, you won't believe it, but every night I dream tomorrow's stories. And my scientist head says, like, no way, but I'm saying, let's come, come, come over, let's do it. So, so I, I don't talk to any person, but I talk to a lot of people who come to me with basically a, a view that says, like, I know you won't believe me. I won't don't believe it even, but it, it's his right thing. And we talk, I talk to them and try to see. And I think that I think that if I had to guess, the answer is there. So I think still that it's kind of you know gray matter that that creates everything. But I think we can build one. And the way to study it from my in my mind is to find anomalies in it and to find uh, people who control it different ways, like those third person who can lucid dream, who expose us to lucid dreaming. I think that those few who have access to layers of consciousness because of whatever thing that happened to them, they can give us access to things that on this kind of access between two to one, we don't see the kind of creature on the fourth dimension that steps into our life. Hmm. Uh, it just brings me to think about uh, psychedelics and the research that's being done there and the altered states of consciousness. Do you think that could be sort of like a tool to explore this question, or what do you think about? Absolutely. About so I, I think that, I think that that's one of the biggest waves in neuroscience as of the last year is basically the comeback of those. So they had like a, they had a you know a spike in the sixties, nineteen sixties, but mostly recreational. People used them. They definitely felt something. They felt okay. I'm, I'm thinking differently. I have access to much more of my brain. The parts that don't get the voice get the voice. That's another answer to what you said. What can you do? You can try to kind of explore the very extreme state of consciousness. It could be when you uh, drink alcohol or uh, high on weed. It could also be when you're in a severe pain, right? Like when, when you go to an accident and you break something, suddenly your brain is as sharp as possible. Uh, even when you go to car accidents, uh, people report that during the time they slam their brake and they're about to eat the other car, it takes one second in the real world, but they experience this like 10 seconds. They kind of, they say, I looked around and I saw the faces of everyone and I hold, like somehow time stands still. It's not real standing still, but our experience, our brain takes kind of snaps of the, of the reality a lot faster and we get a lot more samples of the world. All of those kind of extreme states are a way for us to kind of take our brain outside of its comfort zone and expose it to a different state. I think the world is becoming much more open to psychedelics all over. Uh, generally, like states are passing laws that kind of reduces the uh, reduce the kind of the punishments on on on, on use and uh, carry, and at the same time, I think there are some countries that essentially have partners between 
the police and scientists. So in Australia, the police finds a kind of raids drugs, a kind of you know caves, and they collect all the drugs and then they give them to a room nearby where scientists use them on almost the same people to understand the brain. And in the US, I think that a lot of my colleagues are right now exploring ways to study that. I think the belief is that uh, that there's something there because it's still controversial and a lot of people are still kind of anti and still there's a big risk to some people get addicted and they they're not they should not be any anywhere near so uh, and and we, it's hard to know who they are in advance so it's kind of like the, the blind side is like no one gets until we figure out how to do it perfectly the angle that our scientists are taking right now is let's find uh, drugs that surely help some disorder and focus first on people whose disorder we can kind of remedy with those drugs. And as a side effect, we we'll also study what those drugs do to their brain. So you take people with a uh, post-traumatic stress, people with severe kind of trauma that they can't overcome. And you say, maybe the kind of active component of uh, uh, some MDMA is, is going to actually help them overcome their trauma. So they're a target population. We're going to first study them to make sure that they're not going to get addict. We're going to control how much we give them, and we're going to decide kind of how what would be the purpose. And then we, in the lab, give them this amount to help them with one thing. But then we say, okay, we're already going to give them these drugs. We're already going to do that. Let's also ask them, do you also experience different state of consciousness? When you do, can you take it with you outside? And so on. I, I'm part of a, a collective. I'm going to stop with that because I can talk about it forever. It was a... Uh, trying to do one thing, very specific and very, very hard, and, and but would be a, a little, which is try to uh, find a kind of pharmaceutical component that will take you out of an experience of being high and back in at will. So right now, if you say, take LSD, and once it kind of kicks in, you're for the next, I don't know, one hour to seven hours out uh, on LSD, you're kind of seeing the world differently, and then it's over. And kind of, there are a lot of reports of people who were on LSD and they had the amazing visions and they saw a lot of things and they kind of scribble on a paper what it is. And, and then when they wake up the morning after, they kind of read and it says like, turtle is flying on a, on a mushroom and the sky is, per and I can, I can say, I don't know what I, I don't know. I know that it came from my brain. I know that it was accessing parts of me that, I, but, but now that I'm outside, I don't interact with this thing. So it's just like, a gibberish on a paper and 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 you don't have to go to like external station even even when you're drinking alcohol which is kind of more mainstream the world looks different and you say oh i'm right now seeing different levels of, of kind of I'm, I'm funnier right now or I'm, I'm kind of more open compared to myself i wish i could do that tomorrow and then when it wears off even though it's the same brain, you're not that, and you can't regain it. You can't say, okay, I want to be the guy I was yesterday where I was kind of open and I shared my emotions that I couldn't share right now. So it's like, so I think what we're trying to do is trying to basically create a device or a drug, if you want, that you can be, let's say, drunk to a level that you feel kind of, okay, I'm different. Press a button, go back to not being drunk immediately. Like, get out of it. And then you can write down, and presumably thoughts are going to be actually, you're going to write down something, and you can press again, you're going to go back. So basically, you will have the components in your brain which just gonna get you in and out, in and out. So you'll be able to interact with your regular self and bring them back. Right now they're kind of too separate and, and you don't really have a way to bring one to the other. That If that works, it's, it's gonna be a, both kind of interesting academically, but also useful because you can then do it. If so someone is a, about to drive drunk, you can stop it. Like it's like, you know, extract all the kind of, that that's like that would be really interesting, useful, and very kind of different in how it changes the world. And and you're you're part of a group that's developing that now. So I, I, I it, it sounds so promising that I would say we're we're talking about it. what we do is so a part of a group gets together once every couple of weeks and talks. When we talk, we kind of and there are different people, different, and we basically kind of almost discuss how would it work. What and you know. I want to say that the, in a way from those talks, there's nothing, 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 and then everything. Like one day you kind of all agree that this is the, so right now it's at the not, nothing stage, but I'm an optimist. So I, I always see, yeah, but it's always like nothing and then everything. And maybe tomorrow is going to be the everything. But if you stop me right now, it's conversations in a room by scientists without anything tangible. Hmm. 
Well, that, that's amazing, Moran. And I don't want to keep you forever, even though I'll, I'd love to. Is there any last words, anything you want to say or anything you want to promote? I'll say one thing. So I, I think that if you're listening to this in the world and it's valuable to you, then I think that you should know that uh, you should, we need you. So if there's any pun is right now driving their car and listening to the podcast or running and listening to it on their phone while running and so on, and say, oh, this is cool. I like it. There is a shortage of people who, are, who care, who can do it, who are interested, and we see, we're looking for you. So find a neuroscience, find me, find, a, a, find someone and say, this is cool. I want to be somehow involved. I want it in my life. And I think that there's a lot of like, you know, we need subjects. We need people who can write about it and, and help communicate it. Uh, you know, as wide as your audience, there's surely one person who listens to you who can tell someone else who doesn't listen to you about that. And then they can. So I think that right now we're at the stage where we just need to expand the reach. And anyone has an idea to do that or is interested in doing that themselves, I want them in our life. How could I personally contribute? I, I would love to. So I think as a subject, you can, you, can, you, can, you can be a subject in studies. You can volunteer for that. You know, there, there's a, I right now spend time with you talking about it. Let's say there are thousands of people who listen to that. But there's someone else listening that says like, oh, I wish Moan spoke to my, then, then if they reach out to me and I'll say yes, or I'll say I can do it, but like here's another person. So th I think there, there are just too many people who don't know anything about it, right? They, they don't hear it. I don't speak the right language for them. I don't speak in the right time zone. They don't like my character. So, they, like, so, so the message could be right and not get the right people just because of me and you know, I speak too fast. That's about it. So, so I think in a way we need right now to have everyone know what's in the arsenal of tools so they can use it. I, I mean, I'm personally trying my best all the time to partner with movie writers and, and TV and, and, and theater. People basically have a big, bigger kind of audience and knowledge on how to take complex ideas and make them easier. And I try to get them to do that. And sometimes I just said, but maybe there's one of them right now in the car that says, oh, I could easily like uh, uh, do something. Else. So any way by which you think that this, what we said here, could be expanded would be useful.